Hello everyone. I welcome aboard for another exciting video which is mainly Lisp. Lisp functional overview we are going to see with the detailed on components and control plane, the data plane, how the packet flow and why Lisp is required. You need to be very focused on this particular video because this is a stepping stone for your next video in Cisco SDA how the traffic or workload mobility happens. Right? So the overall agenda uh, or the slide will be speaking about why Lisp is required, what is Lisp and uh, the evolution of Lisp, how the Lisp overall you know architecture used to work and definitely with one of the interesting slides like how the traffic flow scenario happens which would be the core and the key concept what I am going to give you by this video and the data plane flow. So lastly wrapping up a thank you. Okay. So let's take on. Why actually Lisp is required? You know, in, normally in today's world, our overall concept, what is the main problem was there in network? With incrementation in routing tables, there was a heavy explosion of, you know, multi-forming topology aware addressing. With, you know, topology based numbering or node addressing, it's actually only represent the relative location in the topology right so there were few drawbacks so let me highlight you those drawbacks also the first one is it is it requires a very strict and stringent approach because of the nature topology base so it's a topology based addressing which was perfect in static environment I'm not saying it's not wrong or something, which is perfect. I mean, you will be, you know, going very synchronous way. Okay, go by this, go by that. But it didn't work well with some mobile nodes, right? Because mobile nodes used to hop and off between your uh, one point to another point. So changing their point of attachment, right? And secondly, it results in suboptimal routes. Because every cluster, I mean, cluster is a group of router has a limited knowledge outside their topology or you may say cluster so they only know what is the immediate connected uh, devices advertising to them which normally result in suboptimal path and it could possible that it is taking longer path compared to your shorter than because of an hierarchical routing address management right so and also one of the thing is as i said uh, Right, one of the three main problems for cloud mobility which which is not being catered in our normal topology based addressing compared to which is the traditional routing called and the another key important thing with the within you know advent of ipv6 so the dual functions of ipv4 and your ipv6 normally it's getting a blockage it's not being that much effective in this particular routing scenario so what is the solution? The solution which actually comes up called LISP. LISP is called as Location Identifier Separation Protocol. What is that means is LISP normally creates two addresses for each network node. Right? It's a com combination. It's a combination of your identity and your location. That is what LISP is. A simple definition. So what normally LISP offers you is, it, it just loosens the location slash ID, the duality, I mean the location ID by creating two parallel IPv4 or IPv6 address spaces, whatever the addressing space you are working on your network, right? One serving as an identified location, which is called routing locator. Another serving as an identity endpoint, right? So you can say that the endpoint are the devices which are going to communicate over the network and routing locators are those devices which are actually serving for saying that this endpoint is with me. Makes sense? A simple definition. To, to, to separate these two spaces, tunneling is implemented with outer header using R lock or you can say routing locators. And the inner header is used as EIDs endpoints. So this particular slide, you would have gone, I mean, just you would have understand what exactly is LISP 
with an internal high level addressing space and why lisp is required because of the problem i mean just three problems which are actually not a major one right now may be coming in future okay let's go to the next slide what is lisp you know what what, what is lisp if, if someone asks me i mean i used to think uh, about the old uh, in old uh, days uh, like uh, what used to happen like uh, what is uh, uh, with uh, you know if i need to dial in a number or mobile number how we used to get into the right path with just some number dialing correct so what exactly i'm just going to give you an explanation with something like with a mobile number or the mobile phones or or you can say telephone rooms, how we call and how the segregation or the location or the identity was segregated in those days. That was in telecom area. Now that has been migrated or been transformed or adapted in our networking area. So I'll just going to articulate with those examples to make you more clear what you mean by Lisp, right? So what is a locator and the ID and why do you need all these separated all of a sudden that will be in your mind at the moment why you want really correct so let's take an example of an uh, you know, a person or how do you normally dial in a phone number to your relative or your near or dear ones you know that in old days right it tied the numbers to a specific CEO or central office switch in the office so when I need to route a call to to a number let's suppose plus four oh eight four eight six six oh 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 it was relatively trivial to figure out the call needed to go to which specific central office in certain location let's suppose california at the moment right and send it on that particular way this all worked when during the time of your phones on tables or maybe you know they are connected on your walls and stuff but then came the concept or the evolution of mobile phones what i'm saying is when it's a fixed mobile or the telephone was the everything was switching concept so you know which call need to be routed because of the the term and then the plus one as an code so it's a us number right something like that so what happens when the evolution of mobile phones comes the mobile mobility Suddenly, all the mobile phones has a 9-1 area code. I could be anywhere on the planet or I could be anywhere on the earth. The phone network need to be able to quickly and efficiently route the call to me while I was on the go. Correct? While my phone number is still uniquely identified me, that is the identity. And the location information is no longer useful for me to actually finding me. So how that happens? So what happens in the numbering scheme so the, the, the nutshell what I'm going to say is the mobility and the identification and the ro lo location identifier in the mob in our telephone concept what I'm going to explain to you what I've explained to you that actually evolved in our data IP addressing scheme with the concept of less. So let's see what is an example with our mobile number or how the telephone room. So if you see with this number plus one the one actually means it's in US. So we are narrowing down where exactly this particular person is going to call. What is the destination? Right? So one means it's a US. And the next three codes means that it is some sort of location inside an US. So let's for example, let's take San Jose 4A408. So we are still narrowing down. So means if it, it's something someone he is trying to connect in San Jose because of the 408 code, right? And the next one is, it would be a number specific to a central office near that particular one, 486. And 6000 or maybe something different is an endpoint of that uh, central office location reach, maybe some house which is having that particular number. So you can say that 486 is something like an R-lock and 6000 is something like an endpoint. Make sense? So same concept we applied in IP addressing. Same concept we do in our data, ne data networking with the concept of IP addressing, right? Many of you know that 
you also know that a lot of time and effort goes in efficient allocation of IP addressing and designing of your routing architecture. It's an, it's an ask to maintain a systematic design with a branch office might have a specific set of subnets allocated to it. Similarly, some rack will be allocated with a dedicated IP addresses in specific subnet. Unfortunately, much like with your you know invention, I mean uh, with an evolution or advent of mobile phones model in what we have seen, the client mobility and work mobility normally it's a bit cumbersome in our traditional routing. Right? So if you see in the IP addressing, the first two octets represent a network and the last two represent a specific host. So it is more or less like like less like last two hosts represent hosts or network, I mean endpoints. So what we are saying is Lisp is something like a locator plus an ID which help you to narrow down the endpoint and help you for a mobilization of an endpoint across your network. So let's see what actually the evolution of Lisp helps out. Right? So with an evolution of Lisp, what happens, let's take an example of uh, majorly workload mobility and why that is more efficient and there comes a Lisp evolution, Lisp introduction. You know that in data center, much of the focus are normally being maintaining an adjacency, adjacency between the two data center. I mean, the layer two adjacency. Certainly, I mean, stretching between the data center so that your workload of the same IP subnet and the same gateway is actually uh, moved across your you know, network with the flawless, right? So, and those technologies were very much uh, efficient and uh, like uh, they, those technologies have a very uh, given you a lot of flexibility in terms of workload mobility and all those things are the key solution like VXLANs and OTB are one of the best examples which, which are the running and trusted solutions, right? But normally what happens is there is always a limit and at some point your layer 3 boundary need to enter into that particular solution where Lisp technology helps to achieve that. What do you mean by that actually? Let's take an example of a VX line in this uh, particular talk. While we say the technology allows a great freedom for movement of your VM uh, or the L3 default gateway, I mean the connection on the rest of the world are still being pinned down onto your original location. What do you mean by that? I mean if a VM in DC1 is there, right, the gateway is still there in DC1. If VM get migrated or get crashed and it's mobilized to your DC2 but your gateway is still pinned down to DC1 that is what I'm saying right so what I'm saying is with VM migration within the data center it's not really all that a big deal since the route to the outside world probably the same for the entire data center if you're looking we are moving the data center it means less sense so if you're in branch one in Mexico, let's suppose, and accessing a data center in, in New Jersey. Now think about a situation due to some issue, workload in New Jersey need to migrate to Chicago. So even though your workload is now in Chicago, your path to the outside world is still through New Jersey, right? And you are looking at a less efficient traffic flow. I mean, the day because the default gateway is still pinned down in New Jersey. Then it will go to your New Jersey default gateway, then Chicago workload, then again New Jersey, then to you. Make sense? So you have totally lost connectivity. So you consider that if you, I mean, I'm just telling you, consider that if you totally lost the connectivity with the New Jersey, that could cause a big outage. Ideally, you would want your workload on the go to dynamic mapping to the nearest optimal default gateway. However, in this case, Lisp would probably do the magic. Make sense? So that is why I'm saying is everything most of the things would be of an automation fashion where the optimum path is being identified automatically with the concept of Lisp. So that, that's where the Lisp evolution happens. I'm not denying that OTB or VXLAN are, one of, are not the good technology. They are good. But by Lisp is required, hope you understand with some example what I'm going to show you now on the screen and as well as what I have already told you what is happening 
because of optimal path routing issue so as i said vm is gone to dc1 because of some issues and cra uh, crash in dc1 but the gateway is still in dc1 still for the outside world the gateway is in dc1 and the traffic is hopping between your dc1 and dc2 which can impact the performance issue right what happen when uh, we say like uh, the dc1 or something is going you no know, down then you have a massive outage how it will automatically uses the concept of lisp that is what we are going to see so that's why what we are saying is then there comes an evolution of uh, lisp so what is lisp right you should see now this, that is a uh, this this particular video on Lisp, why I'm emphasizing on deep concept of Lisp with some of the live examples and the use case demo because this is directly proportional in our SDA architecture. In SDA, the, how the workload mobility and the roles what we have seen uh, of the components of the data components and the control components, mainly data component, are directly mapped with this particular concept, right? So how does the magic work with Lisp? At its core, Lisp create an extended address space, which normally separates the host ID from its location and allows a concept of map and NCAP routing scheme. I'm repeating, it's a map and NCAP routing scheme. So Lisp uses map and NCAP scheme. The map part used to pull a mechanism, which is very similar to DNS. With the DNS, you will always query a DNS server for a given name. Like for example, www.cisco.com, you will say it will go and query the DNS, what is an IP address? And you will get back an IP address. With the Lisp, you can query the Lisp mapping server that maintains the R log to endpoint ID binding for that particular location of the host. And it get back the address of the R log routing locator, which is serving that host. With this information, your local router can now encapsulate the overall traffic between your R lock to R lock and send it traffic to the remote router, which can then ultimately deliver to your destination house. See how simple it is. So they have come up with a beautiful example and the technology concept, how Lisp work, Lisp work with the same concept of DNS. So if you see on this particular slide, you have a DNS server, you query the DNS server, you get the IP address and you reach the destination host. The same concept happens in Lisp is you have a Lisp mapping server and Lisp map server used to give you the destination of that particular endpoint with an R lock ID. So this is an R lock ID and you are just doing a map and a cap. See, it's as simple. It's not anything a rocket science you need to worry. Simple concept. You just map it, DNS mapping or Lisp mapping and encapsulate to the endpoint, right? So in this particular say that the red portion is your R lock. For example, I'm just giving you, then if you see on uh, the video, the map server is giving two particular information, EID and R lock. So the red portion is your routing locator and your blue portion is your EID. That's the beauty. So once this has been given to your requested R lock routing locator, that will make an automatic tunnel between the two R lock locator as an outside header and the inside header would be the EIDs only, right? Which we are going to anyway see on our next slide about Lisp packet header and components. I hope you guys are enjoying. If you have any query and doubt, you can definitely add on to my comment section in the video. I'm happy to help you out, okay? So next slide normally speaks on about Lisp packet header and component. If you see, it's, it's very straightforward. I mean, it's not anything, uh, some rocket sense you need to worry about. It just the outer red header identifies the source and destination of the router, while the inner, which is the, in blue color, it identifies the actual source and destination host. I'm not going to dig into this particular Lisp header for the purpose of this particular video. You can definitely check out our IIDF standards and other you know, URLs, which actually gives you more idea on that one. So let's see what are the main core components in Lisp, how things actually work with some uh, 
traffic flow and the roles and responsibilities of each and every devices right so in this particular slide what you're saying is you have a user with an IP address 192.168.100.2 and he wants to access 10.10.10.2 another server in some other location so these two are called endpoint IDs right and you have two routers what you're saying is ITR and ETR so what do you mean by ITR actually an ITR is a terminology in Lisp world which is called ingress tunnel router an ITR is, is, an, is an site edge device, I mean it's a list per site edge device that receive packet from site facing interface that is internal host and it encapsulate that to the remote list site and forward to a non list site. So you mean to say the ITR is some, someone who is actually taking feed from your sources and then it encapsulate what we have seen on the header slide and it send it to a remote remote device as an encapsulation packet and what do you mean by ETR ETR means egress tunnel router and ETR is an again the same Lisp site as device it receives a packet from your core force core facing interface which is your uh, the tunnel which is initiated from your ITR and it decapsulate the Lisp packet and delivers to your actual local endpoint at that particular site simple clear ITR it takes the feed or takes the traffic and it encapsulate ETR takes the traffic from your other remote sites in the Lisp topology and decapsulate make sense okay so as I said ITR is a device which normally receive the packets and encapsulate right and ETR is a packet which receive the Lisp packet and decapsulate and which happens all the way the tunneling concept so we as I said the roles of all these uh, device uh, I mean the functions what happens is both are EIDs at the right and left and ITR and ETR right so now the next part what we are going to speak is how the actual packet flow what is the header and uh, what are all the source and destination IP addresses are getting changed when user 192.168.100.2 wants to talk to 10.10.10.2 how things happen let's see with then detailed packet flow right so when user wants to communicate as i said that's a source and the destination these are the eid packets inner packets when it hits the itr it actually add the outer header with its source address correct and the destination is our ETR source, uh, ETR IP address, right? And the destination packet and the outer header actually been added in which the actual tunnel forms. Once the traffic or the packet lands onto your ETR, it decapsulates the outer header and the original packet is sent to your destination host, which is 10.10.10.2. So it is one main thing on the diagram, I mean on the diagram or you can say on the flow you need to understand is that it's a unidirectional process. The receiving host would go through the same process to determine the proper path going to other direction. That is why it is called as cleaning where ETR could determine the routing locator for sending the EID by looking at the list pattern okay so continuing more on Lisp components what is a Lisp con a component in uh, the topology we'll go with the same topology so majorly the important one is the map server a map server as an acronym it says MS in Lisp infrastructure devices that all the ETR register to it with their EID prefixes. If I say EID prefixes, it's normally the IP addresses. I mean the endpoint IDs which are behind the EID. Those uh, details are get registered with map server and map server stores the registered EID prefixes in a mapping database where they are associated to a routing locator like an example of ETR. In this particular view, if you're saying that map server would be registered 
with an ET uh, with an uh, EID of 10.10.2 10 and with a routing locator of 220.100.20.2. All list side use the Lisp mapping system to resolve EID to R lock mapping. Simple. So what does that mean is all the Lisp sites, Lisp sites mean the Lisp understanding devices, they use a Lisp mapping system. Lisp mapping system to resolve your endpoint to your router device. Where is that particular endpoint is? Another key important function in this particular co concept is map resolver. MR is an acronym in Lisp infrastructure device. It, it, it's as if like the ITR, the ITR devices normally sends a map request query when they want to resolve where exactly that particular endpoint is residing on your uh, Lisp infrastructure, right? So map resolver, resolver is actually help you to get you to the right routing locator. If it don't have, it will go to your map server that get me the IP address or the routing location identifier for this particular endpoint ID. So this is the basic definition or this is the basic roles and responsibility of a map resolver, a resolver and a map server in the Lisp world. Okay. Just move on and let's focus on some of the key areas like control messages. There are two types of messages in Lisp functionality. One is the control messages and another is your um, uh, data messages so control messages what all the control messages number one map request message which is being sent by ITR for any endpoint ID lookup or uh, what is the endpoint ID to R lock mapping so that the R lock reachability are being mapped and uh, before the TTL is actually getting expired or expiration Know, of the mapping happens so that is one of the control messages another one is your map reply message which is again by sent by the ETR back to the ITR that the request whatever you have sent I have the mapping you make sense we, we are going to have a detailed packet to what exactly I'm going to say or what I'm actually speaking to you guys and the final one is the map register message the map register message is sent by ETR to your map server like what I said in my previous slide to register the EID to R lock mapping mapping database happens where exactly the EIDs are residing right next comes a couple of data messages what happens is so majorly is the Lisp uh, the number one data message in this particular terminology is Lisp map cache so it normally lives on your ITR devices which has an EID to R lock mapping populated by the map replied messages or ETR and ITR which which must respect certain policies by the ETR. The cache is only populated with the entries for an active flow. So it is not actually been there always. So only for an active flow. The second set of data messages less site mapping database. So what do you mean by that? Lisp side mapping data. It again, it, it's 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 something that which lives on your ETR and maintain that particular EID to R log mapping. For ETR in the local Lisp side, the ETR is considered as an authority for that particular EID. Authority means that I am the owner for this EID, something like that, and will respond to the map request. If someone is requesting to reach this particular EID, I am the one who is going to reply to you. If you don't have come up with a standard process going to MR and M, uh, map server, then map server will come to me and then I will respond to you. That is what we are going to see in our next slide, how the overall Lisp map registration request and reply happens. So which would be the beauty in actual Lisp. If you understand this particular concept, overall uh, technicality, how the things happens, same is applied in your Cisco's SDA world. Okay. So coming to the section of a map registration, how the map registration request and reply happens is normally what happens is ETR 
you have the overall topology with uh, map resolver, uh, resolver and the server so what happens is an ETR normally sends a map registration message to your map server so this is what happens from the start with the EID prefixes what it is going to serve the map server then injects that into an topology where it requires to propagate across the topology including the map resolver wherever appropriate the map server aggregates those prefix to get from various registration it sees no the mapping themselves not propagated only the prefix so you can find the map server that can tell you how to get how to get something like 10.10.10.0/24 right only the prefix is get right it's not the overall mapping function so you can see that the etr must send the map register message what all the eids it is serving so you can the message would be something like that you can reach this particular prefix and via me so map server propagates into the topology to also to resolve resolvers also that if you want to reach this so you know Agre uh, so, so these are the aggregated prefix to get uh, get it from the various registration I mean various registration mean for the sake of uh, various ETRs for the sake of this particular video I've just taken one ETR I'm telling you make sense so exactly I mean for the uh, simplicity I mean I'm just taking a single ETR and a single map server but probably the deployment scenario would be multiple ETRs and multiple maps server for high redundancy and high availability design which is a different uh, talk for the video right so things happens is ETR then I mean the standard I'm just repeating ETR register to map server and map server propagate the prefixes to your topology so once the ETR gets a request let's suppose right so now what happens is the map server advertised to map resolver so that is what the how the registration happens so next we are going to see how the request and reply works the user when it actually sends a traffic how the overall process work correct so let's see that so user let's suppose the user in 192 .2 wants to communicate to 10.10.2 what happens so that is where the map request and the reply concept comes into picture when the traffic land onto your ITR ITR sends a map request router that he is looking for 10.10.2 and it actually goes to your map resolver map resolver will check his uh, database if it don't have it will query to your map server that map server please let me know for what is the routing locator for this particular prefix right map server because it is having the overall database lisp mapping of route locator routing locator to your eid prefixes during the registration process because all the etr has already registered it will send you to the respective etr stating that this particular prefix is actually belongs to this particular etr in its site mapping database then the ETR directly sends a request of map reply to the ITR that I am authoritative for this particular EID. So initiate a tunnel directly to me on 20.100.20.2. That is the overall Lisp concept. So that makes the Lisp which is not a very difficult to understand this this particular overall concept is been leveraged in Cisco's DNA world for workload mobility for wired users and as well as for wireless so let me just again explain you this particular traffic flow for map request and reply how it happens so once the ETR gets a request from a host assuming it cannot find the address in its Lisp cache it will query the map resolver with the map request the map resolver will send back the message that the address is not on its lisp side 
and that info will be installed in the cache and the map server will then pass the map request to the proper ETR which will send the map reply directly back to the ITR through a regular routed network right the ITR will then take the info in the map reply I mean the EID prefix and the R lock or the policy and install into Lisp cache that is the overall working or the deep concept what happens inside a Lisp and what are all the core components who are playing a simplified role which are the main problem what we have seen in our slides in this particular video like if a workload mobility need to happen from one ITR to other you don't need to worry because it's a Lisp connected that will anyway get registered by the ETR and the gateways and all those things gone all the things so what we have seen in the data center so you can think about I can publish and data center subnet in Lisp topology so in case a data center goes down it the, the subnet will be published from the nearest gateway of an ETR so anyone who is from different branch they don't need to worry because they will be going to an optimal path because of the Lisp power or the Lisp magic right so I hope you got a informative information for Lisp because this why I've created this video this is purely a deep concept on Lisp and this particular fundamental has been used in our Cisco's SDA wired mobility workload mobility across the fabric and wireless workload mobility so I would like to say thank you and uh, I wish you are enjoying the video series and uh, do help me out with your comments and feedback so that I can add those and incorporate those feedbacks in upcoming videos so thank you again keep watching and subscribe the videos for more technology talk